I'll try to be up to that level. <laughs> OK, uh, first of all, uh, my computer has to cooperate. I'm on that older one that broke down this morning, so uh, because the other one, well, the camera wasn't working. So let me try and share uh, and share my screen. Sometimes it's going to be a bit slow, but once we have the presentation, that should be fine. Can you see the presentation now? Yep, can see it fine. OK, and is it coming full screen? Not yet. Yes. Yeah, not yet. OK, one moment. Give me the first slide, Deborah. Yeah, sure. One moment. That's the computer. I think it's it's thinking that it's thinking. Anyway, we can we can go on with that uh, form of presentation too if it's not a problem. Ah, it's it's okay to give it a second. Oh, yeah, one yeah. times that um that computers do is if you shared a particular window rather than sharing your whole desktop, maybe it's stuck on this window. Yeah, so you would like me to unshare and use the full uh, full screen view first and then try to share it. Do you think it's going to help? We could try that. And if it if it doesn't um, help or it's it, it could also be just the computer because it is um, computing power intensive. Never apologize for a computer. It's better to say I've got the world's most powerful laptop here and ha ah, technology. Uh, it, yes, it, this is an old uh, computer, but it's uh, surprisingly good. No, but I cannot share when I'm on full screen. <laughs> okay. Funny okay. thing. Okay, one more. Surprisingly good as for its age. Come on, baby. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think it's, it's okay like this. Yeah. It's yes. Okay. It's okay like this. I'll just slide it away <laughs> if I manage to. <laughs> okay. Cool. The classification of GPR signals. Uh, okay. At first, what you can see here in the background is the uh, the appliance I was using to obtain the GPR measurements. That little thing in the middle behind the writing is the little portable GPR, which was fastened on a frame, on a portable frame, to uh, keep it um, at a prescribed height over the ground. So this is how I'm using this first slide first. And now let's... OK, let's go. Uh, ground penetrating radar. It's a sort of radar uh, that is used to read data from uh, some depths of the ground. Uh, depending on uh, the frequency, on the wavelength, uh, we can reach deeper uh, with longer waves or uh, much sh uh, shallower in um, using uh, higher frequencies. This particular radar was um, around 600 megahertz uh, central frequency, uh, which is suitable to a few, perhaps up to a few meters depth, depending on the ground. Uh, we are also limited with its uh, listening time. Uh, in practic uh, practical application, I think it's okay to scan up to a meter uh, and quite clearly maybe to one uh, to half of a meter uh, depth. Um, uh, ground penetrating radar is uh, used in archaeology uh, to detect uh, objects, voids, burials, uh, water pipes and uh, so on, but there is also an application in soil um, in soil uh, science, uh, primarily to detect moisture content with using very uh, 
different uh, setups of uh, GPR uh, uh, appliances. Uh, why I think it might detect soil compaction. Uh, the main factor behind um, the relative dielectric permittivity that affects the signal uh, is uh, water content in the soil. And uh, we know that uh, water content can be affected by uh, soil moisture. Um, it can be affected by a soil compaction by the state the soil is compacted. Um, so it, this is not a definitive uh, uh, presentation of what's going on in the soil uh, when the soil is compacted, but uh, it gives us uh, the reasons to think that uh, soil compaction, soil trafficking can be detected with um, um, ground penetrating radar. The green uh, factors are the ones that I have control uh, over. Uh, these orange ones, uh, they are supposed to stay pretty um, uh, constant over the field. And this water content, which is uh, affected by the presence of layers of compacted soil is something that can be readable, hopefully readable with a uh, ground penetrating radar. Um, earlier, I had several preliminary experiments. Uh, this is very schematically uh, shown one of uh, them. Uh, it was a, uh, an artificial experimental setup in the soil hall. Uh, here you can see the wheelways uh, from tractor trafficking and the, uh, how these wheelways are uh, presented on a time domain radar ground, that's the top bar, and in two different uh, signal characteristics. We'll talk about that uh, later. Uh, we can see that where the wheelway is, the signal characteristic is different from um, from the other parts of uh, the setup. Uh, of course, there is, a, there is a lot of clutter. Um, then after the uh, after the uh, artificial setup, I took uh, the appliance out to the fields. Uh, I've got two experimental sites. Uh, their structure is similar. They both um, are made of uh, a network of uh, a grid of um, uh, rectangular plots, uh, as it is shown here on on the map. Uh, this is. Uh, in this picture, we can see one of the plots. It's a rectangle, and the structure of trafficking on every plot uh, consists of two main wheelways, primary wheelways that are symmetrical uh, around the center line of the plots, and a pattern of random uh, trafficking, a pretty uh, of uh, pseudo random trafficking. It's um, controlled offsets. Um, so we end up with a uh, cross section of every plot that is trafficked with a given number um, of wheel passes every year. And this um, plot is showing the number of uh, passes. We can see that basically we are looking for uh, the highest, for the most intensively trafficked areas in the primary wheelways. And if we are going to look for non-trafficked areas, we will be looking in the center. And this was the structure of GPR scanning um, of, um, uh, of the uh, site. Uh, we had several replications from every plot. We had several replications, five or ten, from the center line, representing pretty much on traffic ground, ground, and the same number of replications from one wheelway. Okay. Um, so th this is again the same picture with the uh, um, GPR scanning the wheelway uh, on the New Hope Yard side site. Uh, so we end up with a few hundred of scans from uh, every data set. Uh, every site, th their names are Large Marsh and New Hope Yard. Every site was scanned twice, uh, one during the crop development in April and the other one was post harvest. So we end up with four um, data sets. Uh, each containing several hundreds of scans. Uh, 
And now a, a short technical note on the way why I decided to go for this way of scanning, the static scanning. I tried to scan the dynamically. That is basically usually you go walk er, along the field or carry the GPR on the uh, on a trolley uh, and obtain a mobile scan. Uh, but there is uh, in what I found out uh, the full height control. Uh, strict height control was necessary, and also there were problems with um, sufficiently accurate positioning. So I went for uh, this way of static scanning, which obviously limited the number of scans. Um, on every side, we know where we are with the GPR. So we are either in a wheelway or in the center, and we are we think that these positions will uh, these zones uh, will differ with the traffic intensity um, we know what tillage depth was was there because every plot has a different tillage depth we know what tire pressure was applied in the uh, in the uh, traffic in tractor we also know what block it was and we have some data about moisture and uh, I have tested classifications, classification on all those uh, factors, uh, categorical factors, uh, but I did not have um, a lot of success with tillage depth and tire pressure. Uh, so we will not be talking about those two. I will present only the results on zone, traffic contrast in a moment, block, moisture contrast. Uh, what is the traffic contrast? Um, let's come back again to this um, plot. Uh, depending on the, the particular um, factor combination on a plot, there were some plots that had uh, some traffic in the center or didn't have enough traffic in the wheelways. So I made a subset of zones uh, in such a way that I was always sure that the middle uh, was untrafficked and that uh, the, the the wheelway zone was trafficked with, say, more than two uh, or three uh, passes every year. It was to obtain maximum contrast between um, the wheelway and the center. Of course, I scrapped several uh, plots, losing some data, but at least I knew that untraffic is really untrafficked and the traffic gets really full power traffic. Um, so this is the traffic contrast and also by uh, adding moisture contrast, um, by adding uh, moisture data, I was able to um, label um, the observations with either high moisture or low moisture. Also, the middle values of moisture were lost, um, which uh, caused another well problems with uh, the sufficient number of data. So basically zone traffic contrast as it's um, as its uh, subset. Block, which is detected su uh, surprisingly well and moisture contrast. OK. The general structure of the data acquisition. We had uh, static scans from uh, the GPR, some field notes from scanning. Of course, I had to know what I was doing. The information on the stru site structure and soil moisture data. This is all um, handled early by um, by a bunch of scripts, which I'm not going to show here. And uh, what we get is a ready time domain data set row wise in CSV format. Uh, one uh, average trace per scan and the data labels with the whole information, what site, what date, what plot number, uh, what treatment uh, and so on. Uh, this is what the uh, data structure looks like. Uh, one row of that CSV. Is a one uh, radar trace averaged from the whole static scan. Uh, it's uh, the procedure called uh, stacking and it's supposed to uh, improve 
um, signal to noise ratio. So uh, rather than have a few hundred of traces per um, scan, I have only one to deal with. Um, this is what, if you plot one row of that CSV, you'll get such a structure. This is the uh, number of sample. We have uh, 256 samples on every trace. We can also see that the mm, uh, signal is very strong at the beginning and it decays later, and the late arrivals are very weak. So this is a time domain uh, signal. Uh, and the, the signal or its transformations become vectors for classifications, numerical vectors for classification using uh, machine learning. And uh, I have tested three main options. Uh, one was that um, I just took a section of the time domain signal and it was treated as the feature vectors, just sample by sample. So if I had a 40 sample, um, that is five nanosecond long uh, section of a signal, time domain signal, it, it meant that my feature vector was uh, of a dimension of 40. Um, FT is a spectrum calculated by um, uh, Fourier transform, it's a, uh, it's a uh, function in uh, base R, so it's easy to do. Uh, you get a signal uh, transformed into a um, frequency domain, and also you can take a desired uh, section of um, that uh, frequency transformed signal and use it as a feature vector, vector for classification. And finally, SA, uh, signal attributes. Uh, it's a number of signal attributes taken from basically from various papers, <laughs> various ideas, some original ideas, but also um, uh, I found um, uh, research works in which signals were classified by their strength, by the total energy, by the magnitude, uh, by the position where, where the maximum is, and so on. And uh, so I made a set of 20 transformations and when they are ordered in the same um, sequence uh, for every um, signal, they can be used as a 20 dimensional set uh, feature vector, vector for classification. Uh, the signal attributes are calculated, seven signal attributes are calculated from a time domain trace. Nine are calculated from amplitude spectrum. And four additional ones are calculated from power spectrum. And please don't ask me why, <laughs> but it seems to work. It seems to work. Um, and since the uh, raw signal attributes have very uh, widely varying uh, ranges, and basically, um, machine learning systems do not like different ranges um, uh, in the uh, in the feature vectors. In the features, uh, each feature is normalized uh, by uh, z, sc z scaling, uh, z norm, and further by a logistic transform. Uh, we could end up with Z normalization or just normalize it using range, uh, but uh, I found out that uh, it is better to um, apply uh, a transformation which is almost linear for most of the points, uh, while um, uh, the outliers are sort of bent inwards so that the whole um, the whole um, range, uh, the whole um, normalized signal stays in the same uh, range from 0 to 100 for um, this um, equation. So whatever was the range of the, um, the raw signal attribute, after this procedure, every feature sits in a range between 0 and 100 with uh, the mean 
centered at 50. The processing flow. Uh, earlier, what, what I showed earlier, a few slides earlier, was the pre-processing, uh, which um, output from which was um, the data set, the time domain data set. And now this time, time domain data set goes into the processing flow, uh, which operates, uh, which has Keras as, uh, as its core. Keras is which sits uh, here in the um, uh, script named model train and test. Uh, it looks like that. Uh, Th this first script um, serves the purpose of um, making some set of uh, inputting some settings it, just by by manual input. Uh, uh, you can set a desired um, depth or uh, the option whether you are using uh, the signal attributes or the uh, Fourier transform or the time domain data. So this is where uh, you do it via the first uh, script, and it is pretty messy because it's just a workbench. Um, hey, can I uh, interject yes. and ask a question? Yes. <clears throat> this this workflow, um, you've mentioned it a few times, but I feel that a lot of people in the meeting will probably be new to this kind of data and this kind of thinking, but um, correct me if I'm wrong that this workflow mm -hmm. is uh, is one that you would use for this kind of data um, with with, as you said, a Fourier transform to convert um, lots of those linear features to um, to tame them, <laughs> so mm -hmm. to speak. We use Fourier transform a lot of times in various kinds of digital signal processing, like like um, sound data. And, and this is very similar to sound data. It's got energy in a lot of different frequencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, frequencies. And we're crunching it down into less dimensions than than a very, very large you using this this mathematical trick Fourier transform. And I guess I'm very interested in this um, workflow because it's um uh it's similar to uh in a um uh I guess a popular I, I was trying to struggle for the word, but I think the word is actually it's it's popular right now in data science to uh, use a, a workflow and suite of tools called natural language processing. And um, we use this workflow if you're using that on, say, human voice for natural language processing. So this is a very general one, and I think you it's I think it's right. You just applied it to your version of the problem. Uh, well, the, this uh, processing flow is uh, is just a specially written um, the, of course i was using a lot of functions that uh, are around uh, and this is one of the fantastic things in r that you just uh, google and grab the tools <laughs> that are nicely there for you <laughs> so uh, the main tool here is the keras that does the classification but yeah. of course there is a lot of uh, tools and functions that work before uh, for example in the model data um, uh, script uh, the, before you get the features the matrix of features the, this is the place where you actually do this trick by the, taking the um taking the raw time domain data mm. and this time domain data set of course with all its headers and all the information is what gets here uh, and the calculation of the signal attributes happens exactly in this uh, script and you get the features matrix. Gotcha. I got yeah. you. Yes. So it's it's very complicated, but you're yeah exploiting the workflow that in in these open tools. I think is your slide number ten that I was thinking of when this passed. Um, just two slides up. That, that one. Where you hit yeah, where you hit it with a Fourier transform, and this is very similar to how you would do audio files. Yes, it's it's here. It's this is here. But of course, when 
I choose the option when I select manually the option. OK, let's uh, use uh, time domain signal for classification this time. It happens here when, when you just open the model master looped uh, a very nice name and manually enter the option. OK, let's do time domain data this time. Uh, the whole th this part is bypassed because it's it's never used then. Uh, the features is created from just by taking a, a uh, section of the time domain trace. And every time the normalization happens. What whatever um, option I'm using for uh, the classification, the the uh, data undergo this normalization. And when I gave up this uh, step, the um, uh, performance was generally going down. So it helps. Yeah, I, I got you. I think you're bypassing maybe some of the heavy. Fourier transform like you might hit with a sound file by normalizing all those separate channels in the time domain. So this is kind of technical stuff. I don't want to side rail the uh, the talk. I just wanted to clarify that and uh, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Basically, basically it was it's uh, the features is a set of um, uh, of numeric vectors and whether they are obtained directly from the time domain uh, data, just taking the signal as it is and normalizing it, of course, across the features, or by uh, using the uh, Fourier transform directly, just take the spectrum and uh, try to uh, classify on the spectrum directly, or by calculating the uh, signal attributes, it works uh, roughly the same. Uh, OK, so. Uh, here we go. Uh, th this is the model data where calculations of classes and features happens. The model train and test gets the classes and features and splits uh, them into training and test sets. Uh, it takes 75% of the observations um, to the training set and the remaining 25% uh, is the what, where the performance is tested. Uh, the model is um, compiled and the prediction, predictions are generated. Uh, confusion matrix is um, calculated. And there is an option to save the trained model for future use. I'm not showing it here, but I tried it. It's not fantastic, but uh, it, it works somehow. Then the uh, uh, more, a report is uh, being output. OK, so let's now concentrate on the on that option with signal attributes because here the uh, these box plots are presenting the values of normalized signal attributes and why is it so um what i would like to show here is that uh, if you classify you against you basically classify one class against another or one class against two or three other classes depending on how many classes are there altogether and we can see when we click through these box plots, scat and scatter plots, that no uh, single um, signal attribute is capable of uh, splitting the um, uh, of labeling the two um, uh, the two classes. Uh, this is class HMC, that is the high moisture content and we can see that uh, th this is the uh, these are the, the points on the right that uh, belong to the high moisture content as opposed to the low moisture content vector uh, there is quite a lot of uh, uh, there's quite a lot of overlap between those two uh, clouds of points so uh, if we get this observation we know that it's not in this uh, class. If we get this observation, however, we don't know if it's not in this class because we've got similar values in both classes. There's a lot of overlap here in the top of the picture, although there is a part which is not overlapping. And let's click through others. They separate slightly, but the ranges still overlap. For 
the subsequent um, signal attributes. This is the name of the signal attribute TMV, TVAR, this is the variance, and so on. Uh, so there is some predictive power, but no, none of these signal attributes singly is capable of um, separating the, the two classes. So this is why we use Keras for multi-dimensional uh, classification. Um, and the next thing is I would like to, uh, I would like to show is the uh, correlation plot uh, for the attributes. This is the my set of 20 attributes with their names, and uh, the core plot is showing the, uh, the uh, how they are correlated. The larger the dot, the more correlated they are. Uh, red. Uh, the red dots are negative correlations and the blue dots are positive correlations. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I hope that the, if, if when there is no correlation, basically there is a predictive power in the whole um, in the whole setup of um, in the whole set of um, attributes. When there is a strong correlation, Basically, there is a redundance. We can replace one uh, variable with the other because they uh, bring the same information to, um, to, to the system. When there is no dot here, the correlation is weak and uh, we get the uh, increasing predictive power of, um, of the model. At least this is what I think about it. That's exactly right. That's exactly the way I think about it too. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, perhaps we, would you like me to show the script now? If uh, my computer is uh, is okay with that, let's yes, yes. Every, let's unshare. It wants to see a car crash. If a computer mm -hmm. handle it, let's just see what happens. <laughs> okay. Somebody click the doorbell. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I had my uh, just a moment. I had my scripts uh, opened on the other computer and i thought it's already already ready but it's not just one moment don't look at this one this is messy OK, uh, the settings, uh, the settings script isn't so interesting. Uh, I will open the model data and model train and test and I will just show what is where model data. Uh, can you see it? Is it? Is it of sensible quality now? Yeah, the quality, maybe you could click it up and make it a little bit bigger. Um, uh, is there any uh, shortcut? Control or? Shift Plus. Control Shift Plus. That's that, it. Thank you. Yes. Libraries, the workhorses, Keras, TensorFlow, Reticulate, and some other for housekeeping. This is the. Um, this is needed when the Fourier transform is calculated. Library signal, library moments is also used. And I have got a set of my own functions. Reading in the data 
and here I make a trick which makes the data separate between the the labels and the data proper. Um, and the it is the whole corpus of data is subset to um, the to one particular survey because I do not mix the surveys. I only use the, those four surveys, but each goes singly. Uh, here is several testing options. Uh, I basically tried uh, to see whether the whole result is nonsensical when I shuffle the data. Uh, here, the data are labeled with the treatments and the um, high or low moisture content vector. It all happens on the go. I do not keep this uh, data separately. It's easier for me to, to have a special function that every time you have a mm, data set, it gets labeled on the go. Classes. One of the um, desired labels is selected as the label for this particular classifying uh, run. For example, it can be uh, it can be mm, zone. Um, these are some additional testing options, and here is where the features are created. Uh, the features are uh, selected from um, the data side, uh, from the mm, uh, by taking the mm, uh, section of a time domain signal, and then depending on the option, it can be. SA calculation, the signal um, uh, signal um, uh, attributes calculation. The Fourier transform calculation only, which then becomes the features. And option three, time domain. Uh, well, th there's two more options I wasn't using then finally. Here is the time domain calculation, and it also becomes the features. Finally, after this section of the code, we end up with classes vector and uh, features vector. And then the feature, this is the place where the feature uh, vector is um, scaled. This is what I uh, showed this uh, normalization uh, process using scale and the exponential, uh, the, the log uh, curve. Uh, and we end up with features which are ready to go to um, the next uh, script. The model stats is optional and we can have these nice box plots we were looking through. Uh, we were clicking through a moment ago. Uh, so. Um, the model master looped. Uh, calls the next. Um, script, which is the model train and test and we'll open it now. The model train and test gets classes vector, features matrix, and also the some uh, several settings. Uh, and what happens here? This is the place which uh, the, the the block of code which uh, does the splitting, um, the random splitting of the observations, so that seventy five percent of the observations goes to uh, the training set and the rest, uh, the, the remainder is left for later for uh, testing. Um, I'm not doing it exactly it uh, here with just uh, uh, some uh, primitive uh, function from um, like sample or something like that, because I have a function that splits uh, the data set so that every class is represented in the same way. Um, because it's if if you've got especially if the um, data set is not uh, very strong, uh, then some classes can be over represented in the training set and under represented in the test set. And I think it's bad for 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 the whole process. So uh, I'm using a function that takes care of splitting every class with the same um, with the same ratio. This is why there is a specially written function for that, which works somewhere behind the scenes. 
What, what uh, library is that um, train test split? It's this, different this classes. Is me. This is me. I wrote it myself. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, it's well. It. I think it could be much better if there was a very professional IT uh, guy uh, doing it, but it does the job for for my sort of data. Um, and and we are uh, closing in on Keras quite soon. Uh, this is the preparation of classes for Keras. Uh, I uh, write down the levels of classes to retrieve them later because the classes are coded for Keras. Uh, this is the, uh, the one hot encoding of classes. And the features uh, here, they are split uh, using the using this um, index of train and uh, output from the uh, test and train split function. Uh, the classes uh, are split and the uh, features are split using the same um, index. And finally, here is where Keras sits. This is the definition of the Keras uh, model. And as you can see, I'm reusing what uh, what uh, Joe Roberts uh, <laughs> presented <laughs> two years ago. <laughs> but Standing uh, on the shoulder of giants. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> hopefully. OK, so this is the definition of the model. Uh, the definition of the architecture of the models, basically the layers are being added. The model is compiled and used for training. This is what does the training. Uh, I have uh, uh, switched off the history option because it uh, takes more time and I do not make any use of uh, of the plots it makes. Uh, but plotting takes time, uh, takes time. So this is where the model is fit. And finally, it is applied to the test data. XTE is the test data. So the model, the trained model, is applied by the function predict from Keras, which is then translated by argmax and simply uh, classified by numeric. And this is all written into the predicted labels. So we've got the predicted labels and we've got the true labels from from the test um, from the test um, uh, set then uh, what happens uh, i have written another function which is named confusion matrix and it outputs a list with many useful uh, parameters uh, it also does the um, uh, outputs the accuracy and um, precision and recall for every every class. The accuracy is general and precision and recall are um, for every class separately. The uh, trained model is saved uh, into a um, into a uh, folder. Uh, well. Shall we risk running it uh, here, or let's? Oh yes! Oh, oh no, yes! You oh yes! You want to not run it? How okay. long does it take the train, Pushman? Let's 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 run it. Well, we can uh, switch on the training option for uh, just to see visually how it happens. Uh, yeah, let, cool. Yeah, just let, mm -hmm. let me see if if we need one more. Wondering where we need that. Uh, it's probably the number of epochs if you want to reduce that. Uh, epochs 50 and line 61, maybe reduce that down to like 10 or something. Uh, epochs, uh, it goes quite. Oh, if it goes decently. Just, it, yeah, it goes it, good, but what we have to do, uh, we have to. Um, limit, to limit the options here because we are not so much interested in. Uh, okay, let's switch those two options uh, so that we go down with the number of loops. And we need a bracket here. Yeah. So we've got two uh, sides, and let's switch off those two lines too. I 
think we need to remove this thing here. OK, I hope it's going to work. OK. Uh, but, you know, I'm using two computers and sometimes they uh, when they cooperate on Oops. <clears throat> when they cooperate via OneDrive, uh, they change the uh, paths and it may not work. Sorry for that if it happens. That's, that's OK. Let's we'll just give it a yeah. shot. We're right here yes. at the end and it's been a it's been a journey. Yeah, this is this is pretty cool stuff. I like what you're doing and I cannot wait to see the uh, confusion matrix. Yeah. See how accurate the how accurate are the predictions. Talk us through it before you show us. Uh, um, OK, the predictions. Uh, let's right. let's see what's going on here. Oh, it's not going on yet. <laughs> OK, yes, there it's re it's reading in the Kara Keras package. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the predictions, uh, they are. Uh, if uh, in terms of uh, the zone, uh, the wheelways versus centers, uh, one of the uh, one of the data sets has some 75% results, but we have to think about the number of uh, uh, of the um, classes to do, uh, because when uh, we've got uh, two classes roughly represented by the same number of observations, 50% uh, accuracy is random. Uh, this is okay. 50% uh, accuracy is random, 75% accuracy is non-random, but I don't know how strong this is. Uh, looks, it is working. Uh, if we've got four classes and the accuracy is 90%, which is in case of the blocks, 80, 90%, uh, it's definitely not random. So it means that surprisingly enough, the blocks on the field are detected very well. And uh, the whole line of thinking I've got behind is that it only supports the theory that the GPR um, is uh, mostly influenced by um, by moisture content because the moisture content is what uh, is what varies between my blocks, especially on the new hop yard. Oh, there was something wrong or was it good? Was it an error? Hmm. Let's try again. Let's try again. Okay, just, a, just had a warning error. Yeah, the, there was a. Uh, there are several. Uh, usually, there are several warnings, uh, like there is no GPU setup and so on. But uh, let's see. Maybe it's going to push through. Okay. It, Something's happening. Yeah, something's happening, but oh, maybe it's not able to open one of the data cardinalities and biggest. Um, okay, let's use the. Um, not this one. Sorry, I've got. Originally, it was a Polish keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Let's use the um, signal attributes option. Okay. So uh, basically, this uh, the uh, success in case of blocks supports the theory that it's uh, moisture behind it because the blocks do differ. Uh, I'm not able to do it on this uh, on this uh, computer. The last computer I was using was the, my son's laptop and something must have been, uh, you know, uh, the other one must have taken the rug out of the legs <laughs> from yeah. the legs of this one. <laughs> that's uh, that, that's fine. This has been very interesting, yeah. but maybe to wrap it up. Um, yeah. Could you just make a few remarks? Uh, I asked about the um, accuracy. Yes, let's uh, let's come back to the presentation for a short moment. It's not yeah, longer. Sure. Uh -huh. What is that presentation here? 
OK. Uh, so again, every uh, every run, uh, simulation run, uh, classification run, in fact, is um, assigned by uh, the accuracy, which is one number for the whole classification, and a precision and recall for every uh, class. Um, OK, and these are this is the uh, uh, plot showing the uh, classification results uh, for several settings. Uh, the columns are the four data sets, the four columns. The four rows are uh, the labels block, uh, moisture contrast, traffic contrast and the zone scale on the side goes from zero to one. That is the, the a percentage of uh, success. Uh, the, uh, there are three sets of. Uh, there are three sets of um, options. Uh, Fourier transform, uh, signal attributes and time domain. Uh, and pairwise in colors uh is the depth uh, down to uh, 10 nanoseconds and down to 15 nanoseconds of time domain signal uh where are the highest successes new hopyard low crop block as i said is detected very well uh sometimes in some runs it's 100 percent detection absolutely without any errors uh, but typically like 80 and 90 percent uh blocks are also detected well uh, in the uh, post harvest um, in the post harvest uh, data set just want to for people that aren't used to looking at this kind of result what this is showing each one of those rows is a um, category of your classification set and the height of the bars is the um the accuracy the, uh, well it's the it's the probability or the proportion of correct guesses for mm -hmm. your training or for your test data set rather. So block is predicted very well. What is MC again? Remind us. Uh, moisture contrast. This is the based on the uh, accompanying uh, accompanying moisture data. Uh, and this should be better for the first uh, for the first um, <clears throat> data set of the season on every um uh, uh, on every side because i had data with it that were fitting the uh, first season so these numbers are slightly higher than these and these numbers are slightly higher than these here yes the april yeah. data this one and this one yeah, moisture contrast traffic contrast was uh detected uh with more accuracy on the large marsh sides these are the two sets of bar plots and also the zone had a higher better effect on the large marsh especially uh, post harvest uh, here the, these uh, results this one this one and this one are hovering around random because this mm -hmm. is 50 percent so these are hovering around random we are only looking at those that are departing from random but it may be the the zone you know, doesn't doesn't appreciably change the thing you're measuring. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, can we uh, can you wrap it up by there's a one question I have and we can ask ask if anybody else has a question, but there's one, I think, an important question to kind of think about. You've got some results here. You've got some evidence that um, you can predict these zones. Um, what what is the endpoint here? What do you what do we want to get out of this? Would this be something that a company would commercialize, or something that agron agronomists might use as a service themselves mm -hmm. to make their job easier or more accurate? <clears throat> uh, the the whole aim of the project is uh, the problem of soil compaction, uh, the the influence of soil compaction on uh, the crops and how we can avoid it. Basically, the, the whole the, these. Uh, Special, um, specially trafficked uh, experimental sites are uh, to assess the the way of trafficking the field so that we are not losing so much crop. And this is why this particular uh, zoning um, trafficking pattern is. Um, and 
the another holy grail in agronomy is to detect uh, soil compacted areas uh, without digging because basically the, the traditional ways of uh, detecting soil compaction in the soil uh, are quite laborious or slow, uh, require digging, require um, putting uh, penetrometers in the soil and so on. And if uh, an uh, agronomist would like to uh, remove the compaction from the soil by, for example, a deep tillage, uh, uh, we would rather limit as much as possible the extent uh, of that uh, operation because it's uh, uh, because it's costly uh, so that would be nice to have a remote or proximal uh, tool uh, which detects where there is compaction in the soil without any digging i don't know if uh, uh, if these um, results are promising enough uh, but uh, um, maybe at least this tool could be used uh, for zoning in a similar way as um, electrical conductivity is used. Electrical conductivity is also uh, driven by a lot of um, factors in the in the soil in, at the same time, uh, and the results are usually very muddled. But nevertheless, it is successfully commercialized. <laughs> so maybe ground penetrating radar could at least be used to a uh, similar uh, similar stuff. And I'm not saying that this is the, that this is the best way you can use the GPR uh, data. At least this is the way I try to do it in my research. I think um, I think we're over time just a little mm -hmm. bit. It was really interesting. Um, I'm thinking here of the data science folks that are in the audience. And uh, a thing I really like about this presentation is that you, uh, you you may or may not now after after getting into this stuff, you may self describe as a data scientist, but I I mean, you might self you might describe as a plain a plain scientist, a working scientist who has adopted data science tools to, to do something good. And the way you've presented the results is uh, to me interesting because it's, you know, you've invented your own way to show the results. And I wonder um, if the the folks that are used to looking at the kind of way that data scientists present the results or um, the kind of conclusions you've come to come to at this stage, are there any comments from anyone? Anyone? Any ideas? What do you and maybe if there are or aren't, you could say something about where you're going to take this. Are you finished or you have some more to do? I saw Harry flinching there. Do you have a do you have something? I just think the visual way that you've show, you've presented your, your your findings is much better, a much easier way to understand than a whole report where you have to find the finite detail of what you've actually found. It's good. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show the processing behind it too. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, no, the process behind it's perfect. It's the it's the fact you didn't have to dig through an academic journal article just to find exactly what they're trying to say at the end. Do you know what I mean? Like just having yeah. the graph in front of you, yeah, at the end of your presentation there, just completely yeah, sure. showed exactly what you needed to know. So you say I've lost the impact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just a, a quick question? It's not about the uh, presentation of the data, more about the collecting of the data. You, you've identified the, uh, the 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 probability that the soil, the uh, moisture, is having a very big effect on on the results. And I wondered if you'd considered calibration. You know, maybe burying a known object at a known distance before you you collected your data each time. Uh, I tried this approach, uh, but the uh, the influence of anything that's in the ground on the, the GPR signal is very entangled. It's really entangled. Uh, the the success. There the, there are several papers that um, uh, that are presenting a successful detection of uh, soil compaction in the ground, but they are mainly results of work. Uh, done in an uncluttered, very uniform uh, environment. For example, in a soil being filled with a uh, with the, um, uh, sand or uniform soil and compacted at uh, some depth. And in the same way as you would detect 
a pipe in the ground, then you can see a reflection from that uh, from that um, uh, layer. Uh, but uh, how uh, it? Uh, but uh, I did not see a direct uh, representation of. Uh, a single characteristic of the soil being translated into single characteristic of the signal, with the exception of uh, works by Benedetto on soil moisture and its influence on the spectral maximum. Thank you. Did you, uh, I sort of remember, now this is going back, um, who I want to say a couple of years, Prishmek. Yeah. You humbly brought your data to me, and you had done some PCAs and some other stuff. Yes, and K-means. So I wonder if there's a way, like with the um, with the amount of the proportion of variance explained, uh, to compare some of the traditional methods with this method. And um, I mean, I could I could imagine for applied scientists that uh, just a methodological comparison, for example, in how much variance explained from the two methods and how much you would gain from going to the extra bit of deep learning. Uh, so you think of applying several methods to the same data set and. Yeah, you, I, I mean, uh, you could do this in a way like um, no, no fiddling about trying to do it with traditional methods like um, like, uh, well, I think it'd be hard to do it with purely traditional methods, but you could do it with principal component analysis would be one way. Yeah. Another SDM. way. Yeah, SVM possibly that's a little bit trickier, but random forest classification and regression trees straight up that'd be a that would be a sledgehammer way to to attack this problem because you do have quite a lot of data, but it'd be quite appropriate. And then finally, this and and you could say, okay, well here are the gains and the uh, uh, with each of the methods in and also the gains in terms of. Um, the costs, rather, in terms of levels of complexity, you have to expose yourself and uh, flogging your data <laughs> with. Yeah, yeah. That it would be definitely it would uh, the whole problem would benefit with uh, having more data, especially when we are using uh, machine learning. Uh, but I had this very uh, peculiar constraints on the amount of data I could collect uh, because I had to use that static uh, method, which means one scan one line in the in the observation set if i was able to collect data uh, <clears throat> in in a mobile way i would have hundreds of thousands of observations and keras there, would benefit there's there's a thing that you didn't show in your diagnostics um, or your results that would be typical for this kind of model and I, I thought maybe one of the guys i know when i say this you guys will know what i'm saying but nobody has, has asked it, so I'll just ask it as to wrap things up here because we're over a bit. But um, when we evaluate, one of the ways we evaluate these models is we look at some some measure of um, either the uh, amount of of um, the proportion of um, of uh, positive guesses, correct guesses, like you have shown, or some measure of model loss. And, and we do that over time with the number of epochs trained. It's one of the it's one of the ways we mm -hmm. tune these models, but some kind of diagnostic measure in terms of training. And so we can we can increase the amount of data, right? Quite right. But we often uh, my my silly joke that sometimes people get and some people sometimes people don't is uh, you go to war with the data you have, not the data you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you have an X amount of data, but you could increase the amount of training time that you've got. And, and then once you start to asymptote, either in terms of accuracy or the loss in your model, you start running the risk of overfitting, but you've got a nice yeah. big chunky test data set. So that's probably not much of a risk here. But uh, I just wondered um, what happens if you train your model for 150 epics or uh, would your model bear it, or you've, have you already squeezed all the juice you can out of there? Uh, I didn't try as many. Uh, I was somewhere between 30 for quick tests uh, up to perhaps 80. Uh, the, today's results were trained with, I think, 50 or 60. What, helped, what helps you decide is um, looking at those diagnostic graphs of yeah. the variance explained. So 
basically when it gets flat and there's no point of training it any further. Yeah, yeah, and your and your model trains so fast that um you know the difference between eighty and one hundred and fifty is negligible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I uh, just to add one more thing at at the end. I tried. Uh, I mentioned uh, pre. Uh, evaluation of the um, uh, of the, the signal attributes or whatever features I, I've got. Uh, it was a module that did something like that. Uh, it was calculating um, uh, p-values for uh, every pair of um, uh, labels and uh, was ordering the mm -hmm. signal attributes uh, from the lowest p-value, that is the most separating ones, to the worst. Mm -hmm. And uh, once I ran the model adding one signal attribute at a time along this, uh, along this sequence and in the opposite sequence, I got two totally different curves. That is, it means that it is possible to pre-evaluate the, uh, uh, the signal attribute, the feature, and say how much it is going to contribute to the model. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, a random forest would do that in a, in a very efficient way. It would okay. rank, it would rank, I would, I would, in fact, I would hit this, looking at this particular way you've told the story today, I'd highly recommend you look look at random forest and just just hit it with it and see what happens. You'd be able to rank where the information is. OK, fantastic. Thank you. Good. All right. Any final declarations or proclamations? I just want to thank Prismec. That was really cool. It was uh, fun to watch that. Thank you. I'm going to turn off the video now and uh, I'll see you guys next week. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye, everyone.